we talk about that now then, Monty? Let's do that then. Because yes. obviously another okay. thing that was a massive problem with this whole topic was even industry experts and fans just kept saying over and over of Harris, like, just just make a salary cap then. The same people arguing like we need more and this like they were like, just make a salary cap then. Like the team should just salary cap then. Like what what are the legal ramifications around how you set that up, why it couldn't be done in the past? How could could it actually happen in League of Legends? I mean, it could happen, but it can't happen until the players go ahead and unionize. We are not. All right, all right, all right, all right Harris. So I was making this, I, you know, I basically I said this. So to your points earlier, just to go go through them as we approach this topic, you know, the, the issue with unionization previously, part of it was that the players didn't want to be salary capped because why the fuck would you? Why the fuck would you want to be salary capped? On it, like, let's pretend, guys. So, uh, as as Thorin discussed on his video that you can find on his channel, which is true, is that a lot of the major sports leagues and entertainment businesses in general shoot for about fifty percent of revenue going to the players. And part of having a union is negotiating a lot of the time the percentage yeah. of revenue of the league that gets to the players. That's how salary caps are set. OK, and so when a new deal comes along, so, for example, in the NFL, they just signed this 10 year, what, 100 billion dollar media rights deal. And that is set to in, in, increase the team's salary caps, I believe, this coming year. Is that right, Harris? Am I right well, on that? So, I mean, I'm more I mean, I know that the NFL has obviously the biggest rights package. It's like six point eight billion dollars a year that they're paying right now. But but generally speaking, what happens is you have the hockey. I'll, I'll take the NHL because that's what I speak in. Right. You have hockey related revenue, which is just the aggregated revenue of each of the teams in the league. Mm -hmm. And you divide that by two because it's 50 percent, 50 percent right now. That's how much they share. And then you take the per capita midpoint for each team, which is just dividing by 32 teams because it's 32 teams in the league. So you divide by two. Then you divide by the amount of teams in the league. That gives you what's known as a salary cap midpoint. Then you take 115 percent in excess of that. That's the salary cap ceiling. And 85 percent is the is the floor. So this is kind of the Got mechanism it. that you have to spending in the NHL. Right. It's a hard cap imposed by Gary Bettman in 2004, 2005, after he kind of failed with the NBA in 1983. But like basically what you have is a system where you cannot spend in excess of the midpoint, which is 115% in excess of basically 50% sharing. And the uh, reason you, and the reason you have this is, is twofold, right? Because what was happening in the NHL pre 2004, you had, and, and this is the NHL, 76% of the revenue that was spent in the, uh, was, uh, the, I'm sorry, 76% of the average re revenue of a team was spent on players in 2003. And that resulted in a couple of things. Team, the NHL was losing $300 million annually, right? Period. On top of that, you had teams that were going out of business, like the Pittsburgh Penguins, who had declared bankruptcy twice before that happened, right? And on top of that, parity was at an all-time low. But you, in, in terms of the actual, you know, the, the 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 amount of, like, the point distribution in terms of who's the most successful teams, so you impose this salary cap, the players are going to make a little bit less money. Yeah, they're not. it's not 76% anymore. In 2005, it went to 54%. Now it's 50%, right? But they, they bargained for that. And then the parity in the league actually went up. And the league actually started making more money because it's more interesting to not watch the Colorado Avalanche and Detroit Red Wings and New York Rangers be really good every single year. Maybe the Tampa Bay Lightning could be good. Maybe, you know, just right. saying generally, right? So, like, so, yeah. so basically, the point is, is that you are making a, a bargain as the players to maybe take less of the revenue, but in return the hope is that you get longer sustainability of the league and it's not a race to the bottom in terms of spending and whichever really rich team owner decides that they want to lose money that season or for a lot of seasons because certainly very very wealthy billionaires can just run this as a toy and continue to dominate the league uh over and over and over again which reduces parity and reduces overall interest but to the point here this is the way that the leagues are set up Right. And so when you come into the LCS situation now, why, you know, the question becomes, why would they want to voluntarily enter a salary cap situation that was tied to league revenue if they were, in some cases, making 200 percent of the team revenue collectively as players? And the oh, reason why you the reasons you could do it to, like, help, like, on the rest of the scene and develop any talent and keep all your friends jobs. And then you can make sure everyone has longer careers. You make sure every single team has a really good chance. All those things that everyone used to argue against the teams in Riot recently, that would apply to the players. Oh, wait, do the players have to give up their money? Should Doublelift vote? By the way, you know that a salary cap tomorrow means Doublelift never makes the salaries he's made now. He's the top one. So he immediately 
gets averaged out, it's other fuckers in other teams will get the okay money. Like, people like Doublelift, when they actually have to put their own money on, they'll never vote for that, man. They would be a fool to even. Also, I'll just throw this out there. This is where, you notice I tried to do this a fucking million times on that Four Horsemen episode, but Philip Hiram had sort of an agenda, so he didn't really want to have certain discussions. I tried to explain abstractly that you have to actually have, like, a consistent perspective on this, and you have to give away your biases. Are you from a team perspective? In which case, this is good for you because you're a team. But if you're a player, that might not be as good for you. Are you a player in this sense? He wouldn't do that. He tried to act like there was sort of a moral component to this, and he was the righteous one, you know, fighting the good fight. Here's why I don't understand this whole approach, is what is this? Is this... WWE, in which case it doesn't matter if I'm the heel and Monty's the baby face and Harris is the fucking jobber, as long as at the end the show gets watched loads and we all make out, don't we? Because we all have a role to play and it's not real. It's just all a big show. That's what you want if you want pure parity and you want a different champion every year like the NHL for like 10 years or something. Right? That's how you get parity. But I'll tell you what, that's the opposite to what people want in a business or just to see excellence, like one of the reasons in European soccer why actually people like the way it is is because if you happen to be the team that gets the billionaire Saudi owners, congrats, you might be winning the European Champions League next season. You might go from irrelevance to having the best players in the world winning. And then also, how about this? Is it WWE and it's like one collective thing or is it individual businesses? Because people have to decide, are these individual businesses? If they're individual businesses, then actually if I'm cloud nine, why the fuck should I share revenue with the worst team in the LCS, which is what happens in the NBA, if you don't know. If I spend more of the money I brought in, why do I have to pay a luxury tax as they do in the NBA to be the Lakers and get extra star players? Why do I have to do any of those things? So what you have to ask yourself is, which is it? Is it a league-wide approach? Is it an approach where we're being as fair to as many players as possible, but we're actually going to be very unfair to premier stars like LeBron James or Kobe Bryant, who would be on $100 million contracts if this was football, by the way. That's literally what the case would be. And then to be bid on, they'd get $200 million from the Saudis to go to the next thing. So people have to ask themselves, what do we want for the overall approach? You can't just pick and choose. It's not a buffet. You've got to have one approach and then that's what we're going to try and implement throughout the whole scene for players, for teams, for the league. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is the argument that I made is that the players made a very conscious decision not to unionize years ago because th those were the good times because they didn't anticipate what are now the bad times. And so the bad times now, you know, the, the other part of that is, as Harris mentioned, is that there's a salary floor in these leagues, right? And there is a salary is. It yeah, there's a salary the salary cap. Yeah. And there's a salary floor now, but that salary floor is a lot less than the players would probably like it to be and could and have it's made totally just over the legal mandate as far as I can tell right. as well. Like, you know, we right. can't really know well, what they'd put the floor out otherwise. Right. So to, to Harris's point, like let's say, for example, he mentioned the NHL having an 85% of the cap floor, right? So it's 85% of, of the cap. Of the the main point of the camp, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So 85% of of 50%. If someone's a casual 80%. fan, it's just so that you can't have Sidney Crosby, but then pay another guy $1 because you pay Sidney Crosby <laughs> all the cap. It's just right. essentially to ensure even the minimum person has to get like a close, it says 85% right. of the average, right. the mid. Um, so this this is all to say that if we were talking about if we were talking about the revenue of the league right now, which the revenue sharing we know is a little bit over $2 million a year to the teams in the LCS, that would be saying that the teams couldn't spend, let's say, uh, if it's, let's just put a number there, half of the, you know, 50% would be a million dollars. And so 85%, so they couldn't spend less than maybe $850,000 on their five players, on their starting roster. Like they would have to reach that threshold, which right now, if it's only $75,000 a player, guys, they can only pay, they can pay, what you, they can do what TSM is doing is just literally just paying $375,000. Um, so they could have negotiated for what was effectively twice the amount of money as a, as a floor. Um, and I think that's the issue here is that now we have these, we have these teams and these players who are going to be forced to accept other contracts. But Harris, as we talk about this unionization thing, a claim that Philip Aram made on the Four Horsemen was that Riot said, and he couldn't give us the reasons why, so we will have to speculate. But he said Riot would fight the creation of a players' union tooth and nail. And he said that they couldn't actually become a union because there's no way they could outspend Riot Games. 
in legal fees. I assume you want me to respond to that. Um, well, I listen, do. generally speaking, you know, when you have a union, they, they're they're self-funded, right? They have certain funding mechanisms to, to go ahead and, and- Should pay part of their contract to it, right? To fund their the union, dues. presumably. There are yeah. dues. Yeah, you don't have to pay for the English in the world don't really seem to talk about. You like to just go to a free meeting. Pay part of your salary, homie. Chuck in 100K, we'll get union going tomorrow. They they could go ahead and do this, and and they could they could go ahead and unionize if they wanted to. I think he's talking in terms of practicality that he's going to have to yes. fight against Riot Games. Yes. And you know what? I would say that there have been plenty of times in the history of professional sports where there's been a a union, or there have been players that make that don't have as much money as the billionaire owners that go ahead and unionize and they fight. Like look at Kurt Flood. He brought his. You know, he was making what nine like. He should have been making ninety thousand dollars a year back in the nineteen fifties or sixties, which is basically like you know. But he was making like basically nothing. The MLPA, which was created in, in the MLBPA, which was created in the nineteen sixties, did, did not have a lot of money funding it. And you had billionaire owners, and you basically have these players who didn't make a lot of money because of things like the reserve clause. Go ahead, and they fought and went to the Supreme Court, and they basically just and and they fought the the baseball antitrust exemption in the nineteen seventy two, right? Like there have been examples of players that don't have a lot of money in far less advantageous positions than what the players are currently in the LCS that have gone ahead and done things because it's the better thing to do for their fellow pe players. The reality is the incentive isn't there. There's no incentive. They can get what they, I, I really want to make this clear to your users. Players have gotten what they want by lobbying Riot yes. publicly. They do this. They they go ahead and they make a big stink. They go on shows and they do all of this. And then they force Riot in some instances through public pressure to give them what they want. Minimum salaries. I know, Monty, you're talking about 850K being what would otherwise be the minimum if you divide by five. That's how many players are on whatever, right? Like they could do that if that's the salary floor. But instead, what we have is they basically, a couple of years ago, they lobby, okay, $75,000, you know, that's what the minimum salary is going to be. We want three year cap on that. No one, you know, unrestricted free agency from the time. Like you look at the NHL, when you're a rookie in the NHL, you have a capped amount of money you can make on a per year basis. You cannot make in excess of that. No matter how good you are, Connor McDavid made something like nine hundred thousand dollars a year. He's a top ten player of all time in the NHL, right? Like, and that's almost as much as some of these players in the LCS are making, by the way, right? Like, they they in some instances oh, made more, make more, yeah. make more, right? <laughs> and, and, exactly. So, like, I want you to consider that they have been able to effectively lobby, you know, the game developer or, or the league operator for the things that they want without needing to unionize. Why would they unionize? It's against their interests. It's actually. I mean, you you look at think about how crazy the situation is right now. I am in theory representing teams, right? Like, to, and this again, this is just my own opinion. But a salary cap is needed to stabilize this league. Yes. In that sense, a union with bargaining power is somewhat needed to stabilize this league because teams are spending too much. And you could talk all about how you know it's their money that they're spending. It the incentive structure to make money in this league is through sponsorships. That's the only way that teams really make money in sponsorships. Do you know? What sponsors want? They want viewership. No one wants to watch bad teams. Bad teams routinely get the worst viewership in these leagues. It's just a fact. People prefer to watch better teams. That's just how these kinds of things typically work, right? So then you're racing to get the best teams and spending the most money so you can sustain yourself through sponsorships. That's basically the incentive structure we have to make money in this league right now. It's ridiculous. So the the entire ecosystem from the, the, the way that revenue is generated to the way that it, you know, it pulls up at the bottom and, and the teams are kind of just walked over in the meantime. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It's, it's not sustainable. Something needs to change or this is going to be bad for you know, forever. It's also that the teams can't actually count on, you know, having a, a stable amount of money. I mean, one of the great benefits of having a salary cap is you can know approximately how much money you're going to be spending on your roster year to year. And you can create a business plan around that. You know, when Team Liquid is spending seven million like they did last year, and then maybe spending two or three million like they are this year. Um, there's really wild swings. And like, how do you budget in these circumstances? And what a lot of teams do is they go to their sponsors and they say, hey, we can sign this player. Will you give me extra money to sign this player? Because it's going to be good exposure for your brand. And the and the sponsors say, OK, I'll give you an extra million dollars. Like that happens a lot of the time. Um, but it is really, really hard for the teams to operate as a business when they don't actually have a fixed uh, cost structure to their team operations. 
And in the I'll history the, of oh, go on. this, I know, so sorry, Thorna, you go. And then. I'll give you the reason as to why in some ways it's also not in Riot's benefit to actually have a salary cap and to have parity, because I'll tell you what will happen in the immediate future of creating parity and a salary cap in the league. You can no longer outbid the top European team for that player from Korea. You can no longer outbid China for that player from Korea. So he either won't come or you'll be stuck with the NA talent. Now, the biggest lie of all time was that fans just want NA talent. No, no, they want really good NA talent that's as good as fucking Koreans. Well, if we're all just making wishes from genies, I've got a few I'd go with before that. But, you know, like the, the idea that if you just force people to take NA players, they'll ever be as good as Prince and Berserker is an absurd premise. Like, esports history tells you it's not the case. But I'll tell you what, if you can't pay the top dollar to Prince, maybe even to Doublelift. By the way, there's a world where someone like Doublelift, if they still had many years left in their career, if you do a salary cap tomorrow, he should just go to LEC and play for G2. To get, to get a similar amount of money, millions of dollars, where they don't... Because there's another problem. Notice people aren't examining this. This is why I'm going to bring it back to Riot. People are acting like this is the job market in 1930 in their country, and they work in a factory, and not only can the factory not go anywhere else, neither can the worker. So the problem is, they don't understand when you salary cap the uh, LCS, but LEC isn't salary capped, now they can just get out of control and bring all the good players if they want. So now your league gets worse. And then here's why if you riot, you wouldn't want that, Monty. Because really, all you do when you make parity with a salary cap is help the shittest team get slightly better and have a chance to compete, right? But to do so in the short term, you will reduce the top end talent, which, as Harris just said, is the whole way we're generating interest and sponsorships. And what does Riot care about more than LCS? Worlds, MSI. What do fans care about more? They say they care about LCS. They really want a team to to do well at MSI. They want a team to go deep at Worlds. Well, that's going to stop if you initially have to make less top talent come. This is why every idiot, you could tell the people where the fact was almost poking into their brain and it was about to interact because the way they would deflect it was they'd go, well, if the teams are having so many problems, why did they spend so much money? To make you watch, you dumb motherfucker. You're the guy that didn't want to watch Licorice until he made it to MSI, until he made it to the final of LCS. Before that, you wanted him out of the league. But when he made the finals and when he was at MSI and he looked like he was going to win a game, suddenly you were interested. That's why people pay top dollar for veteran names. That's why people import players. Because as Harris said, the whole mechanism right now is get eyeballs into sponsors, into money back, which, listen, we're still losing money in this equation, but at least something cycling around. The current approach is this if you want to make LCS more pirate, you know, that's going to happen, but it's going to come at a cost. There's a trade off there. Do you want a long term future for the league? Do you want a short term thing? And again, people aren't doing that. They're not saying I'm in favor of the short term solution. They're like, I just want all the good parts of all the systems that I could have, and I should have none of the bad parts. And then the fans literally are just like, just don't spend the money, bro. Just make a salary cap, bro. And like, say, there's no solutions here. We're not even actually getting to the abstract conversations here. So go on, Harris. What do you think about this topic? Yeah, I mean, I think that professional sports have kind of borne out that salary caps are the most effective way to kind of stabilize league revenues, and it's just a it's just a product of math at the end of the day, right? Like, if you if you're not spending more than you're making, then you're obviously going to be more profitable, right? Like, obviously the league will be will, will flourish, and and you won't have teams that are are filing for bankruptcy, and ultimately that's really bad for the league. So I do think that that is a place that we actually need to move toward, and uh, you know, it I think it. I think it behooves a lot of these players to kind of look towards, and they're never going to do this because why would they? But to look towards the long-term future of this, like, is it sustainable to say that we're going to continue to spend in excess of how much we're making every single year? The answer has to be no. And so then something has got to give. And, and the answer is at some point in the future, we're going to have to have these serious conversations. And actually, you know, this is going to sound really shitty to say, but like, I mean, I feel like I have to say it. Most of the times unionization is the result of, a certain worker being mistreated and that is their response to to the mistreatment is unionization and so in some sense it's almost like these players haven't been pushed enough to 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 reach that goal where then they they mandate collective bargaining because as you said like oh they're playing too much oh their work hours are too bad they're not getting benefits like these are things that you talk about in collective bargaining yeah. But we haven't pushed them that far they're actually fairly well treated and honestly a lot of these teams are kind of you know I, they don't they're the players 
possess a lot of power because of their public personas and the way yes. they could they could kind of use these fans against teams and these teams make money through sponsorship. Remember, if a player goes after a team and the team looks bad in the eyes of the public, does the sponsor want to be affiliated with them anymore? Like probably not. So then, you know, it, it's it's a really rough position. And and the answer is that I'm not sure we ever get there until the, the players actually feel some pain. And I don't consider what has just happened to be real pain. No, I really don't. Because <laughs> when you look back at the, the amount of revenue that they're still making, as Thorne kind of pointed out, like it's, it's, it's insane. So if you want to actually get there, what's going to have to happen is the, the economics of the league are going to have to adjust to kind of the reality of the situation. They'll be, you know, low, you know, paid low and then we'll see what happens like that. That yeah. kind of has to happen for this to bear out. And the pain hasn't come yet, guys, because the pain didn't hit the teams until after these player contracts were signed. I mean, basically what happened with the market was that when a lot of these player contracts were signed in November of last year or the players are continuing on their previous contracts that they had from from previous years that the, the we hadn't seen the VC market completely dry up at that time. We hadn't seen the advertising market, um, you know, uh, freeze their their spends. We hadn't seen phases stock price go rock bottom, which caused investor panic uh, in the esports environment. So none of these things had really occurred yet. And so now, you know, the teams are on the hook for a lot of these contracts. Um, and they are that's why the they are you know, trying to get advances from Riot on future revenue share. Um, and that's why they're begging Riot to cut the the NACL teams, which triggered this entire mess, was because they're trying to stem the bleeding. But what's going to happen is future contracts are going to be very different, uh, most likely. And that's perhaps when the players are going to do something and unionize. I mean, what, what's wild to me, Harris, though, is that in all of this, you would have to imagine that Riot... And the teams would be the one in favor of a salary cap and hoping that the players unionize and perhaps the players would be resistant to it. Yet again, to return to the conversation with Phil Aram, he says he claims that Riot would bitterly fight this legally. It's which not is clear to me that Riot would want the players to unionize because that's a headache that they have to deal with from a union perspective. It's beneficial to the teams because the teams get to impose sure. a salary cap. What benefit does it does it give to Riot? It doesn't really give anything other than a headache that they now have to deal with a union. Well, right? the, the argument would be is that if they if the teams don't, you know, if there isn't a salary cap, that the league itself might bleed out entirely as owners continue to go bankrupt or fold and then they they wouldn't have a a product. So that's that would market be correction. That yeah, exactly. That that's just called the market correction, right? Like eventually they could just bring in other owners who will spend a little bit less on, on in that theory. Of, like, it eventually they, takes care of itself. Eventually, yeah. Unless there's people with unlimited money, eventually you get someone who does spend less, and collectively the league goes down. The point is though, that's not in the favor of the players. You notice that's why to me the dumbest thing about this whole beef against the everyone who wasn't a player was fans actually trying to put the sentiment out there that if you ever use a scab, we will hate you and your org and your sponsors forever. That is pointing a gun at one foot, blowing your toes off, and then pointing your gun at the other foot and going, you better not move there, homie. It's your foot, you idiot! That is the lifeblood of your literal scene is the sponsor. If you go after the sponsor, there's even less for you all to fight for in the future. Then how about this? I'll tell you another reason why in the long term players won't do this. Because right now, if you're double lift, you're going to play one, two years more. You're not going to play a 20 year hockey career. You have no reason to care about the health of the league. You actually are incentivized personally to get out with the back now. You are essentially part of a heist. There's not enough money coming in. You are going to get as much as you can and get the fuck out before it all collapses. And then also, I'll just throw this out there. This is also why you have to have people who know the law to even comment on what's possible because I saw idiots making all these observations. You know, the LPL has a salary cap and in LCK, they've got this way of sharing the revenue. Right, I made this point on the last one. Just look up two words, Chebol and Jichuan. These are basically <laughs> like family-run approaches to businesses that own other businesses. By the way, spoiler in America, antitrust would ram you up the ass all day long if you did yeah. anything like this. So those are countries that do not run on the same rules as America. You cannot expect to just port what they do like a blueprint because what they already do probably wouldn't even work in America. I don't think it would be allowed in certain cases. So no. they can do a lot of other things. That's why I made that point that like, just let me know all those players who supposedly voted, all those Koreans, go home and give it a go, mate. When you get home, say you're going to do a walkout on the LCK. Let me know if you have a career, by the way, because also in your scene, they have infinite replacements their scab player might be better than you mate that's the joke to see more cool funny interesting clips based on topics from my content well subscribe to this channel then or you know be a pleb and don't